Okay, hi everybody. So first off, I just wanted to apologize for the Google Meets mixed up, mix up. Um, yeah, it was my first time using Google Meet, so I'm not super familiar with it, but was able to kind of figure out the issue by the second period. So it shouldn't happen again. And I will just send um, the specific meeting code before class. Um, that way you can get in if you're learning from home. Um, and then for my students who are in the first period and we're in person as well, um, please use this. Uh, I know that it being a Monday and one of my first lessons and things like that, I know things were a little spotty. And so I want to make sure that you guys understand this material really well. So it will be available to you um, to review and to just like make sure that you understand and you get a really clear explanation. Um, so yeah, we're just going to kind of go through it. If you have any questions, email me. Um, my email is tgray at stmarysmemphis.net. So do that and I can try to, and I answer pretty quickly and will, yeah, answer any questions you have. So we're going to start here. I'm going to go ahead and present the screen. Okay, so chemical energy and ATP. It's my understanding that I don't think ATP has been covered specifically yet, at least not in the last semester. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Um, you'll just hear the shortened name pretty much every time, but it's a little um, helpful when we kind of get into um, other things involving what it's used for. So ATP is an energy carrier. So when you break down ATP, you're releasing energy for cell processes. And likewise, when you are making ATP, you're using energy in, from the cell. So um, little note, molecules in food store chemical energy in their bonds, which then leads us to the fact that ATP is going to transfer this energy from the breakdown of food molecules to cell function. So this particular diagram is helpful to kind of see what it's what it means to go from ATP to ADP and the reverse. And so we'll just start here at the top. So adenosine triphosphate, so there's three phosphate groups. If you remove one phosphate, that you're going to have energy that is released for cellular processes. Now, once that phosphate group is removed, you now have adenosine diphosphate, di meaning two. So there are two phosphate groups on this molecule. Now, if we want to go back to ATP, you would need to add a phosphate. That's going to require energy from the breakdown of molecules. And some vocabulary that I would like you guys to just know for future references and future biology classes is catabolism and anabolism. So for catabolism, I kind of think of the first three letters, which is cat and how cats can like tear up things and destroy things. And so catabolism is referring to the breakdown of molecules to release, um, to release energy, whereas anabolism is when you are using energy to build macromolecules like carbohydrates and things of that nature. And so organisms break down carbon-based molecules to produce ATP. So when Again, that is a catabolic reaction. So breaking down of those macromolecules makes energy. Now it is something to note that ATP is not really stored in large amounts, but it is being made in many different processes. And up to 36 ATP come from one glucose molecule. That is a number you don't necessarily need to have memorized. Um, it's just supposed to kind of give you a good um, understanding. So. Carbohydrates are the molecules most commonly broken down to make ATP. We will be talking about those a lot, especially glucose. And fats are the ones that store the most energy. So 80% of the energy in your body is um, stored in fat. And approximately 146 ATP come from one triglyceride molecule. Again, that is not something you need memorized, but just to give you a little perspective about this. And proteins are least likely to be broken down to make ATP. Amino acids are not usually needed for energy, um, but this bottom chart, really, I, you don't need to know the numbers. It's more of just understanding that fat is, is the macromolecule that is storing the most, whereas carbohydrate and proteins are kind of about the same. So just kind of keep that in your back pocket. 
So there are a few organisms who don't actually need sunlight and photosynthesis as a source of energy. Some organisms live in places that don't get sunlight. So an example of this would be like um, things that live in caves at the bottom of the ocean where sunlight isn't going to reach. So the process that those particular organisms use is called chemosynthesis. So whereas in photosynthesis, you, your energy is coming from light, in chemosynthesis, you are using chemical energy to build the carbon-based molecules. So it, the process is similar to photosynthesis, but it is that starting ticket of needing light versus not that kind of makes them differentiate. So that is it for sections 4.1. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to sections 4.2. So this particular section is a very big generalization of photosynthesis. We will go into the particular steps of photosynthesis in the next unit. I'm sorry, in the next section. So the main overarching goal or, pro or um, point of photosynthesis is that you are producing sugars that will store chemical energy. So photosynthetic organisms are producers. They are able to make their own source of chemical energy and they use photosynthesis, which will allow them to capture the energy and make it into sugar to store energy. So in previous units before the break, you were able to kind of go over animal versus plant cell and get a good idea of what the organelles of a plant cell are. And so this is where that kind of pops up again. So chlorophyll is a molecule that absorbs light energy and chlorophyll is actually found in chloroplasts. So this figure is just showing you kind of what you're actually looking at when you're looking at a leaf. So photosynthesis actually takes place in two parts of chloroplasts. So it takes place in the thylakoids and the stroma. So the light dependent reactions are going to take place in the thylakoids and the light independent take place in the stroma. And we'll kind of walk through those together right here. So the light dependent reactions are going to get energy from the sunlight. So this happens in the thylakoids. Water and sunlight are needed and the chlorophyll is what is actually absorbing that energy. The energy is going to be transferred along the membrane. And a big part of this process is that one of the waste products is oxygen. So again, we will walk through the specific set steps in the next unit or the next section. I'm sorry. The light independent reactions, however, take place in the stroma. And as the name suggests, it does not le need light to occur, but it does need carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And it is in this stage that we are able to make a sugar through uh, various chemical reactions. So we're going to move on to section 4.3. And in this section, we will actually be able to go step by step and walk through them to make sure that it is understood. So as I previously mentioned, photosynthesis requires many chemical reactions. And the first stage, which is what we were referring to as the light dependent reactions, which take place in the thylakoid, are going to capture and transfer the energy. So this process is actually going to be um, conducted through groups of molecules called photosystems. So the kind of funky part about this is we are using two different photosystems. So photosystem one, photosystem two, but because of just weird discovery times and things like that, we actually start in the in photosystem two, which kind of seems counterintuitive, but it was just how it was named. Um, so here's photosystem two. So in photosystem two, you're going to have a lot of things happening at once. I don't want you to necessarily look at the one, the two, and the three happening like sequentially, whereas like one has to happen, then two, then three in that particular order. There are a couple things happening kind of at once. So we're going to walk through each of those. So energy is going to be in, absorbed by the chlorophyll in the sun from the sunlight. And that energy is going to be um, 
that energy is going to be indicated by the electrons that will enter something called the electron transport chain that is actually sitting in the thylakoid membrane. So while we have that energy being kind of passed through the membrane, we have on the outside of the molecule water that is actually being split. So this down here is actually called a redox reaction, which you may hear in chemistry. But when this water molecule splits, you're going to be releasing two electrons, two hydrogen or two protons and a oxygen. So that's where we see that the oxygen is a waste product. And let's just kind of really keep note of this, of the two hydrogen protons that are going to be sitting outside of the cell. But those electrons are going to go into the, the thylakoid membrane and travel through that electron transport chain. And so what we see here on the right side is we had these two hydrogens outside of the chain. And one thing that you guys had covered last semester was the difference between passive transport and active transport. So to refresh, passive transport is when you're going from an area of high concentration to low concentration, and it's not requiring energy to pass, whereas active transportation means that you are needing energy to go from an area of low concentration to high concentration. So since in this particular example, outside of the outside of the thylakoid, we had the concentration of protons. They are going to be pumped through using passive transport into the thylakoid. And that's going to be important as we move on into photosystem one. So in photosystem one, they, it, it, the electrons are getting energy from the sunlight. And something that is happening that's different that we did not see in photosystem two is this molecule called NADP+. So NADP+, plus, you can look at it kind of as ADP. NADPH is also an electron carrier, just like ATP. So those are kind of equivalents. The difference between those isn't really important right now. It's just knowing that um, they're kind of treated in the same way. So NADP+, plus can be made, can use energy to be made into NADPH and you know, the same kind of process as ATP. So we see that NADPH is produced. So we have an electron carrier. And something else that we notice is previously in photosystem one, we saw that hydrogen ions were getting pumped into the thylakoid. So over here now we're seeing that, okay, we have this high concentration of protons in the thylakoid and they're running through a transport channel, a protein channel, called ATP synthase. So like the name suggests, ATP synthase's purpose is to create ATP. And it does so by pumping those hydrogen cations through from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that particular reaction is actually what is converting ADP to ATP. So this is just a slide kind of outlining what the ATP synthase looks like. And then we get into the second stage of photosynthesis, which will use energy from the first stage to make sugar. So like we said in the last section, the main, I guess, purpose you could say of photosynthesis is to create those carbon molecules to be used to store sugar. So now we're into the light independent reactions. So these particular reactions do not need light to occur, but they do need carbon dioxide. And again, they occur in the stroma. So a molecule of glucose is formed as it stores some of the energy captured from the sunlight. So we're gonna walk through this, this um, graphic because it can be a little confusing. So hopefully I can make it um, clear. So what we're going to say, and it'll be clear as to why we're starting with three carbon dioxides in a little bit, but so you have two, excuse my horrible writing. So you have two and three. So you have three carbon dioxides. And what you have here, I'm going to go ahead and scratch this out so we can just draw it. So 
So, and cool. I apologize that this takes forever. Okay, so what we're actually going to do is start down here where we see that we have three five carbon molecules. So one, two, three, four, five. So we have three of those. I don't really want to draw them out because it takes a while, but essentially what is happening is the carbons from these CO2s are each going to go onto one of the five carbon chains. So they're each going to go on one. So that's going to yield three six carbon chains, which is indicated here. So now that we have three six carbon chains, what's going to happen in this process is we are going to use energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. We're going to use energy to break down those molecules. So we use six ATP and six NADPH to break these down. And how that actually is going to look is we are essentially, actually, let me make this a little clearer. So we are going to essentially cut or split these in half. I realize I left out a carbon, so. Oh no, I did not. I just did not put it correctly. So I apologize, let me erase. So basically what is happening is we are going to have them cut through like this. So we went from having three six carbon malt chains to now having one, two, three, four, five, six, three carbon chains. So this is what this picture is indicating. So we have six of them, but when in this process, what ends up happening is we have one very high energy three carbon chain. So I'm going to do a little arrow pointing up to indicate that it's high energy. So we have one high energy one. So what ends up happening is it actually one of them leaves. So that high energy molecule is going to leave. And we're just going to say that it's going to hang out right here. What we're going to do is go ahead and finish this cycle so before we kind of cover what this what happens here. So one of those carbon chain, three carbon chains leaves. So we are left with five carbon chains here. So what actually happens is we're going to use energy again in the form of ATP to rearrange those carbon chains. So before we had this, If I can fit them. I apologize for my C's, but essentially that's what we had. And what ends up happening is we're going to use energy to rearrange those molecules. We're not adding any carbons. We're not doing anything like that, but we need energy to be able to break those bonds and rearrange. So we can say, as an example, this is how we're going to rearrange them. So now we, we have three, five carbon chains, and then we're able to start that process over. We get more carbon dioxides. We're able to have those six, six carbon molecules and so on and so forth. But what happens over here on this side is we had one of those three carbon chains kind of waiting on the outside. And this process, this whole entire cycle is gonna happen multiple times. So what ends up happening is we're going to have those three CO2s come in again. And since every time you get three carbon dioxides, one of those high energy three carbon chains leaves, we're going to just have it do that again. And so eventually we had this one and then it went through the same cycle again. So we have this and then it could go again and we get more three carbon chains. And what ends up being able to happen is because we have the multiple three carbon chains, these can actually bond together and form a six carbon sugar like glucose. So if you remember at the beginning of the lecture, when I said that photosynthesis, the you know end all goal is that we are able to make sugars to store energy. This is how that happens.
So when that high energy three carbon chain leaves, it's able to bond with another high energy three carbon and form a sugar. So. So again, two three carbon molecules bond to form a sugar. The remaining molecules are going to stay and cycle through the cycle and stay and cycle through the cycle. So the main thing that I want you to get out of these pictures is understanding that what goes into this process, what comes out of it, and that's the overarching goal. That's what you really need to get from this. So I would recommend probably just drawing this out a few times just to really get it in your head. Okay, so we need energy to, br to break this down, but then those are able to go to um, to go off and to eventually go through the cycle more so we can form those sugars with that process. So definitely just review it a few times. And if you, it's something that you want me to, re to cover again, I will be more than happy to, but hopefully this kind of cleared it up. Again, I know the actual C's are a little challenging to read, but hopefully this is understood. Um, and yeah, so I will be sending a link to the Google Meets classroom for each class as um, that way you can get into the class and we shouldn't have any more issues. And I guess I will see you all on Wednesday, potentially. Well, I guess I see everyone on different days. But yeah, if you have any questions, please email me. And again, thank you everybody for your patience and for kind of giving me the grace to get myself going. And um make a good presentation. So, all right. Bye, everybody.